thank you everyone for attending today's distinguished lecture. Thank you, Professor Medard, for accepting our invitation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Muriel Medard, who is a Cecil H. Green Professor in the EECS department at MIT and leads the Network Coding and Reliable Communications Group at the Research Lab for Electronics at MIT. She has served as editor for many publications of IEEE, of which she was elected as fellow and she has served as editor-in-chief of the IEEE Journal on Selected Areas in Communication. She was president of IEEE Information Theory Society in 2012 and served on its board of governors for 11 years. She has served as technical program committee, co-chair of many major conferences in information theory, communications, and networking. She received the 2019 Best Paper Award from IEEE Transactions on Network Science and Engineering, 2019 IEEE Communication Society and Information Theory Society Joint Paper Award, the 2019 William R. Bennett Prize in Fields of Communication Networking, the 2002 IEEE Leon K. Kirschmeyer Prize Paper Award, the 2018 IEEE SIGCOM Test of Time Paper Award, and several conference paper awards. She was co-winner of MIT 2004 Harold E. Egerton Faculty Achievement Award, received the 2013 EECS Graduate Student Associ Association Mentor Award, and served as undergraduate faculty in residence for seven years. In 2007, she was named as Gilbert Lecturer by the US National Academy of Engineering. She received the 2016 IEEE Vehicular Technology James Evans Avant Guard Award in 2017, Iron Weiner Distinguished Service Award from the IEEE Information Theory Society, and the 2017 IEEE Communications Society Edwin Howard Armstrong Achievement Award. She is the member of the National Academy of Inventors and was elected member of National Academy of Engineering for her contributions to the theory and practice of network coding in 2020. She received in 2020 a doctorate honors course from the Technical University of Munich. Thank you again, Dr. Medard. It's a pleasure to host you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, guys. Um, and uh, I truly regret I'm not enjoying the, the company and the weather, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, today is, is actually quite different from a, a lot of things uh, I have done before, but I think uh, it's, it was surprising to me that at this stage in my career when I thought, okay, I sort of know what I'm doing, uh, I end up completely uh, abandoning a lot of the things I thought I knew uh, and revisiting what I thought were well-trodden, well uh, understood, uh, completely worked out or, you know, close to, to completely mind problems, uh, really canonical problems in, in communications. And with that today, I'm going to talk to you about guessing random additive noise decoding. Uh, this is joint work, uh, all of it with uh, Ken Duffy. Um, and if any of you have spent more than about five minutes in Ireland, uh, you know that for everything they tell you it's grand, you know, and grand encompasses it's fantastic, it's a disaster, everything's grand. Okay, uh, and so given that that Ken, of course, is in Ireland and is Irish, it's um, it's it's very apt uh, for for this collaboration. Um, I just want to acknowledge my team. Um, our students Amit Solomon and Wayan uh, at MIT, former postdocs Ishori Conwar and Jan J. Lee, um, collaborator Anantha Chandra Kassan, who's also my dean at Maynooth University, uh, Ken Duffy, who I mentioned, our student Kevin Galligan, and at Boston University, um, Arabia Zizichidil, uh, and her student Arslan Rez, and uh, Chi, Chi Chan, um, she goes by Mandy Lee, and her former student Vai uh, Bansal. And what I'm showing you here on the right is is a little teaser uh, of, uh, of things to come, why you should, uh, why I know it's Friday afternoon and the weather's gorgeous there, but please stick with me for a little longer, why you should uh, stick out with this, with this talk, uh, which is a block error rate, so probability that, um, that a code word is an error, uh, versus um, noise per, per received uh, bit. 
uh, over N0, which is the power spectral density, the level of the noise. Uh, this is a decoder with a state. This is a, a little better than the state of the art chips because this is uh, uh, this is what we'll see is uh, polar codes with um, CRC aided polar codes with something called successive cancellation with list decoding with a list of 16, which as I said, it's a little higher actually than state of the art chips. Um, with soft information, well, I'll tell you later what soft information is if you haven't seen it before. And this is what we do even without soft information and with a code, which right now will be the mystery code. And this is what we do with soft information with the same mystery code. Okay, so stay tuned to figure out how we unravel this mystery. Okay. Um, Apologies to all the people on the uh, in the audience right now who are actually specialists in this area, uh, but let me um, let me just go through this uh, to this slide, which is the principles of coding, such as we teach it to to our students. So what do we do? We start out with data. The data has some level of redundancy in it. We use compression or AKA source coding to remove that redundancy, uh, to make it in effect uh, more efficient in terms of uh, space for its representation. Uh, we then apply channel coding to it to add redundancy generally at different redundancy than the naturally occurring redundancy, a design redundancy. Um, and the reason for adding the redundancy, even though you removed redundancy, is that you're going to send it through a channel. And as we see here from this block here, uh, that's a different color, the channel has some deleterious effect. The redundancy allows you to reconstruct the original, uh, the original transmitted data. That's what channel decoding does. And then you source decode and you should be able to go on forever and forever with basically just a little bit of, uh, of loss of probability of error at each step. Okay, so what else do we tell our students? Well, we tell them that there are limits, there are fundamental limits. This is a, a big remit of information theory to how well you can do this. And in particular, if I have a source S, um, I'm going to be able to compress it to something which is H, where H is the entropy, the Shannon entropy. Um, uh, now, doesn't matter so much what that exactly is, but it's, uh, it's a measure um, of um, of uh, basically how spread out the, the distribution of S is. And you can compress it down so that, you know, say if you have bits over here, you can compress however many bits are over here to that many number of bits multiplied by H of S. So for instance, um, if you look at binary data, H of S is always less than one, greater than zero. So you're compressing it by a ratio of H of S. And let's still think, as I said, in bits, just to make our life easy. Uh, how can we do the channel coding? Well, the channel coding is going to be done at a rate uh, where the rate is basically representing how much redundancy I add here. Okay, so for instance, if I say I have um, this picture here, what I have here is a rate two thirds. Two thirds of the data is actually um, is actually the you know the, the original uh, the original payload, and that rate is upper bounded by again, if I think in binary one, minus the entropy of the noise. And what is the noise? The noise, if I think of an additive, it doesn't really matter whether it's additive, just an invertible effect. The noise is itself a process, just like the source was a process. And it also has, uh, it also has uh, an entropy, just like the source had an entropy. And I basically need to make room uh, for my noise, right? So basically I'm adding this and this will become uh, very much a theme of our discussion. I'm adding this uh, extra redundancy to make room for my noise so that I can correct the noise, even though I don't know exactly what it's gonna be. If I knew what it was gonna be, I would just remove it. I don't know where it's gonna happen, but I know it's a generally it's entropy. Okay, and uh, the, the decoder, what it does is it receives this channel decoding where it's X plus N. Again, think of this plus as just being a very general form um, of addition. So for instance, I mentioned being in bits, one of our canonical uh, models of channels, what we call the binary symmetric channel, where it would be that if bits are zero or one, so think of Galois field of size two, basically doing everything modulo two, a one is a mistake. So it flips a zero to one, it flips a one to a zero, it's a bit flip. So think of it as a bit flip. Okay, so the big flip probability uh, would in effect give an entropy, which corresponds here to the entropy of the process of a bit flip probability. Okay, um, now this is all fine and dandy. 
And you know you have a huge field uh, on source coding. You have a huge field on channel coding. And while the principle is very simple, it turns out that generally it becomes um, it becomes actually quite tricky to be able to uh, up until now, in particular, to be able to to do this encoding and this decoding in a way that is simple. And we'll cover that in our discussion. Okay, so as I mentioned to you before, if I have basically a certain number of strings here, a certain length of strings, say n, then what I've done here is I've reduced that uh, by a ratio which corresponds to h of s. Again, think of it being binary, h of s is between zero and one, okay? Which means also that if I have strings here of length n, even though some, in theory I might be able to have all two to the n possible strings, in effect, almost all the probability is concentrated in a set of two to the nh strings. That's why I can make two to the I can make strings of length n appear with high probability as being strings of length nh s. Okay. The reason I've been able to shrink the representation is because in effect, almost the whole probability of this ensemble of, of strings is concentrated on what we often call the typical set. Um, and the cardinality of that typical set is of two GNHS strings. Um, when I talk about coding, I told you the rate here. So for instance, here the rate would be two thirds, right? Because I have for every two data um, items, I'm actually sending three. Okay, um, well, what I'm doing here is in effect, I'm sending two to the ANR possible strings. Um, if I were to think of doing compression source coding on the noise, um, what I would do is, as I said, if you just gave me the noise, it also has an entropy. Uh, really, it means that almost the entire probability of the noise process itself could be described thanks to a set of only two to the NHN strings, where HN is the entropy of the noise. Okay, so you can see how the source coding and the channel coding are really reflecting each other. If I didn't have any noise, I could send all possible two to the n strings here, and I would never have any problem. I could reconstruct it perfectly. I would just basically read off the data, and I wouldn't have to leave some space for the noise. So this here, the reason the rate is not one is because I have to leave some space for the noise. Okay. All right. So how big can R be? I already told you, but let's think of uh, really sort of how we get to that um, uh, to that idea of how we get to one of uh, leaving space for the noise. Okay, suppose that I have uh, eight binary characters. Again, let's always think in binary. It doesn't matter. You can extend easily with just a little bit more math to anything. Okay, uh, if I have a string of eight characters, um, the ones that I show you here, and suppose there's a noise. I mentioned that bit flip. Uh, in the binary symmetric channel. And suppose that the last bit flips over here, by the way, it's fairly typical that the last bit would flip if a bit is gonna flip, because as I transmit, I sort of lose, uh, lose timing, lose a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of the effects that managed uh, to, to keep the transmission and the, and the reception together. So things tend to get a little bit more wonky towards the end of the transmission. Okay, that's wrong. So what can I do? Again, remember, all two to the n possibilities were valid, then this would just be a valid transmission, a valid code word. We're doomed, right? You're just going to think that that's what I said. Um, if instead we've agreed on a code book, so you know that there's only a subset of all two to the eight possibilities that I sent, and what you received is not part of that subset, you go, aha, that's not right. Let me try to reconstruct what I think she may have said, okay? Uh, and what Shannon told us in 1948 is how dense that R can be, okay? How, how many code words can I make? Uh, and in particular, he said uh, that it can be this, you know, one minus H of the noise. We'll see later again why, although you've seen why, I basically need to make space for the noise. Um, now, we have this since 1948, and I mentioned before that channel encoding, channel decoding is a massive, massive area with tons of, uh, um, of activity in it. So why are we still digging in that hole if basically Shannon told us in 1948 what to do? Uh, well, it's because of what was perceived, uh, I would say up until now, as being a lack of practicality of the arguments that Shannon made. So what did Shannon do? Well, 
Uh, let's start by saying actually what would we like, okay? What I would like is, as an engineer, I'd like to have low delay, particularly in 5G systems where, you know, there's a lot of talk about auto-reliable low latency communications. I want the delay to be short. That's to say, I'd like those code books to be relatively short. I showed you two and three. These are not the kinds of lengths that usually people have. I'd like there to be low complexity. I want to do as little work as possible. That's why I went into engineering. Uh, we want to have flexibility in rate and block length. So we know what the maximum rate is, but you know, uh, I, I need to have a, so, as much flexibility as I can, obviously, while still remaining as high as possible. Um, and I want my code books to be short, but maybe I want them sometimes to be somewhat longer. We'll, we'll see actually how to trade off that rate and block length later. And also, I want things to be robust to the physical re reality of correlated noise, okay? I told you that bit flip model, which is again a canonical model. I mean, you know, there is no such thing as the bit flip, uh, the binary symmetric channel, yet that's pretty much all we work with. Okay. Now, the mathematical model um, has been towards long codes. Why long codes? Large end limit, so that there's some averaging out. Um, we're looking often at capacity, which is a concentration onto the correct decoding at large ends so of concentration to that mean. Um, we typically have, and I'll show you some very uh, vivid uh, illustrations of this. We typically actually have very constrained code constructions because of, the, because of the, the structure that we've been imposing so far in order to try to overcome issues of complexity. Uh, and these issues of complexity have led to school specific decoders. Um, which ensure feasibility at long length. So there's usually a pairing between the encoder and the decoder. One encoder may have several decoders, but by and large, you can't use one decoder on another encoder. Okay, so Reed Mueller, Majority Logic, Reed Salmon, Brevi Kim Massey, CRC aided Polar, which I'll tell you more about later. And I've mentioned before, CA, uh, CRC aided uh, successive cancellation list decoding, low density parachair codes, you know, affectionately known as LDPCs and belief propagation. Okay, there's, there's all these pairings, encoder or decoder. All right, what are we going to do? Um, we are going to make the engineering look like the math rather than make the math rather sorry what, what are we going to do we're going to make the math look like the engineering what do we what do people do now they make the engineering look like the math okay so it's basically like the tail wagging the dog so to give you an example if you look at typical commercial bit flip probabilities that that uh, you know bsc that everybody talks about but nobody's ever really seen um it's you know it's the bit flip probabilities are really low like 10 to the minus 3 or lower okay which means that the capacity which was 1 minus h of that bit flip uh, the entropy of that uh, that bit flip process it's like 0.9 something you know it's huge it's basically 1 what are the rates that we get? Let's look at uh, the 5G new radio da data channel. You know, you have rates as low as 0.2. Uh, you really don't see things above 0.9. It's really anemic, okay? Um, what about those low delays that I talked to you about? Not only are the codes long, thousands of bits, but on top of that, we interleave over multiple code words over hundreds of code words. So that basically the effective code length is like hundreds of thousands. Hold that thought because we'll revisit this at the end of the, of the, of the talk to make the channels appear IID, that is to say independent identically distributed to make the noise appear on structure, okay? And what we're gonna do with the grand vision um, is we're gonna focus on the engineering lead. need. I'm gonna give you low latency. Uh, I'm going to, you know, get you very, very close to capacity, but I'm not really going to concentrate on capacity. I'm going to give you the best rates that we can for whatever length, whatever delay you're willing to pay. I'm going to give you real flexibility, true, efficient, accurate decoder for all short codes, because we're going to show you universal decoder. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use the, any correlation in the noise rather than break it up by interleaving any correlation in the noise, any information, any hint of structure, Give it to me, I'll use it. Let's not throw it away. Let's not throw information away about the noise. Okay, so that's, as I said, we're gonna make the math work like the engineering. Uh, as a first step, 
Let me show you these couple of pictures. P here is the bit flip probably I mentioned before, 10 to minus one, 10 to minus two. And the target block error rate, that's to say per block uh, of a code per code word block. Um, very often, this is a pretty good rule of thumb that you're making the bit error probably and the block error probably roughly the same, okay? So suppose that I was encoding in a block of length n, if I was encoding, my probability of one error would be around one. After coding, it's down to 10 to the minus two. This is capacity, you know, that one minus HN that I mentioned before. Um, this is, by the way, from um, a website on Git, um, a GitHub a repository that was started by my colleague, Yuri Polyansky, and there's many other results and there are many contributors to that. Um, it's called Spectre. Um, and here's a, a converse. Um, so we know we cannot do better than that. There's uh, some achievability results. Don't worry too much about what the achievability results are. Let's just say, that nobody gets them so far. Okay, so they're theoretical achievability results. So, you know, the best, you know, that we could hope is somewhere between that blue line and that red line. And if you look at the reality, actually, um, of, of codebook constructions, it's actually not quite that happy. Okay, uh, I mentioned to you that code constructions are very constrained. Here are some of the codes I mentioned. You know, these are these are classical codes. Reed Mueller, Reed Solomon. These are the different lengths that are actually doable uh, with different rates. Um, red means that it's higher. Blue means that it's lower. Probability of error goes up uh, with the heat map. It goes down. Of course, that gets blue. Um, these are the CRC polar downlink codes. This is for the control channels in the 3GPP 5G near radio. Um, and by the way, if you implement this in MATLAB and you're getting somewhat different things, it's because MATLAB does not actually take into account into the rate the CRC bits, but there's like 20 of them. So you better take them into account because that is eating into your, into your rate. So we, we're actually properly accounting for that. That, that throws for a loop. So, you know, if, you, if you're doing this uh, later, just be warned. And actually there's several mistakes uh, in the MATLAB uh, toolbox that we've had to, we've had to uh, correct. So if you're using the 5G MATLAB toolbox, some things are great, other things, you know, are just are just not there and they're not very fast at correcting them. Um, and, uh, and these other possibilities. Of course, you can do things like puncturing, which is, as it sounds, you just make holes. Uh, puncturing is an art, a dark art, <laughs> you know, it's really, really extremely ad hoc and you don't always know how it's going to work and there's always a cost to it. Um, so even though these are the theoretical bounds, this is the reality of the fact that you can't have all the different code lengths you may want. Um, you can't have all the different rates that you may want, okay? So this is really a theory that's very far from the practice. And what I'm gonna show you today is how in practice to get all these points, all these points. So better than the current best achievability bound, okay? with really easy code constructions. All right, let's go back to Shannon. So what did Shannon tell us, you know, back in 1948 and why is it that we're not doing what he told us? So remember, I have two to the n possible strings, this length and um, uh, uh, code, code word that I'm gonna send. Uh, and a code book uh, is one of two to the n r possibilities. That's what it means to have a rate r, okay? Um, and Shannon identified that as being one minus H. Well, here I'm just saying H is the end of the noise. So this is what I called HN before. I'm just dropping the N so it's not to drag it around, okay? So this is exactly what I showed you before. Chen R put us to the N strings and I sent to the NR strings. So basically what happens is if you look at how many possible strings and high probability I have with Y, I have all the strings that I could send, which is to the NR, and with high probability, one of the likely strings, right? So high probability strings of the noise, there's two to the NHN such strings. That's exactly the property that I used in the first place to do source coding, right? In source coding, I use the fact that even though I may have two to the N possibilities, only two to the NHS of them were high probability, only two to the NHN uh, noise strings are of high probability, even though all two to the n strings may be possible. So what are the high probability y's? Well, for every code word, 
and code words are generally uh, as to have all the same probability because one of the things that source coding does is it makes all of these data blocks have roughly the same probability. We can argue about what do we mean by roughly, but roughly the same probability. So they're all equally likely. Um, so a maximum likelihood decoding and a maximum a posterior decoding are the same because the, the input probabilities, uh, the, the priors are all the same. So you have two to the NR times two to the NHN. So basically what I have is I have in the exponent two to the N R plus HN, and that better be less than one because I only have two to the N strings. Voila, there you go. That's your, that's your uh, Shannon theory in, in a nutshell. Um, and how do you actually construct the codes? Okay, so this is the idea that Shannon had. And he said, you know, I'm going to construct them randomly. And what do I mean by randomly, uniformly, independently, at random, I'm going to take all possible to the NR strings. And I'm going to select uniformly at random with replacement. Okay, that's how dumb my code construction is. Okay, I'm going to say with replacement. I'm going to select this code book of two to the NR possibilities. Okay, so here's my two to the NR strings. I pick, I'm only going to pick two to the NR of them. I pick this one, this one, this one, this one, and then I go, okay, I'm done. Okay, now I'm going to choose to send one of them. Let's say I choose to send this first one. So that's, I'm going to turn pink. Um, and uh, now what I'm going to do is that some, something else is going to be received. And in this case, whatever was received was not one of the things that was picked as one of the code words. So I know it's wrong, right? At the receiver, I know it's wrong. I'm going to pick the one for that output that I saw, y to the n. I'm going to pick the one that maximizes uh, this a posteriori probability. Now recall that maximum likelihood is the same as maximum a posteriori because all of these code words because of that source coding have the same probability. So I'm going to pick out of all these out of all these two to the NR code words, the one that gives me the biggest probability for the Y that I observed. Okay. So why don't I do this? Why don't I do this? I mean, the encoding is so simple. It's so clean. It's so pretty. There are two difficulties. So if N is, you know, I showed you some of the numbers from a 5G radio, say, you know, over the order of a thousand bits, just 128 bytes, and my rate is large. Again, remember, I want my rate to be close to capacity. I want to send as much information as I can. Then my 2 the NR gets pretty large, okay? So the first difficulty uh, with the idea from Shannon was the storage, okay? When I have to go through all of these code words, how do I store all of those code words? So in, uh, in the 60s um, and then refined in the 70s, uh, Gallagher and then some other people showed that actually it's okay. You don't really need it to be random in that way that I showed you. You can actually just choose uh, codes to be linear. That's to say generated by passing through the matrix, have a random matrix, and that suffices. Okay. So I only need to keep the matrix. I don't need to keep, keep the entire code book, an arbitrary, you know, 10, 10 to 277 um, mapping. Since I only need uh, the matrix, actually that takes away the storage problem difficulty. Okay. So the storage difficulty was solved, you know, about a little over, you know, about 20 years after, um, after Shannon came up with his idea. Okay. So the second difficulty, and that one has remained up until now, is the one of the computation. Okay. Even though it doesn't take me very much to store the code book, how do I do these 10 to the 277 computations for each element of the code book. I can generate the elements of the code books easily because you know the storage uh, problem has been uh, has been obviated, but I still have the problem of the computation. Okay, and that's really what has led to what I'm going to simplify here in this swoosh of uh, of evolution of codes. What has led to block codes, convolutional codes, or some of the codes I was showing, like Reed Salmon, or in this uh, family. Blocking convolution are basically the same. So-called modern codes. Why so-called modern? Does they include turbos, which were found in the 1990s, but they also include LDPCs, which you know have been around to this earth longer than I have. Uh, so I don't think them as modern. I'm old-fashioned myself. Uh, rateless codes, which have some feedback. Network codes, which um, 
uh, as you heard before, it's something I've worked a lot in, but it's really more for networks. Um, and you know, the biggest, I would say, uh, real uh, development has been uh, polar codes in 2009 that were found by Arakan and actually are in the 5G standard. Okay, let's go back to this picture. So remember, what do I have? I have two to the NR strings uh, of, of data to be transmitted to the NH, high likelihood strings of, uh, of noise to the NH times two to the NR, it has to be less than two to the N, okay? Otherwise, I cannot separate the noise from the signal, okay? So what am I going to do? Rather than work on the code word, I'm going to work on the noise, okay? And what do I mean by that? Let's go back to the example that I gave you where the last bit was flipped. I'm going to guess that the noise was all zeros. You know, for 10 to the minus three bit probability, bit flip probably, that's the most likely thing, you know? No matter how long the string, that's still the most likely event. Then I'm going to say, okay, if I remove that noise effect, is that still a code word? No, okay. Let's go to the next most likely noise event. Say that it was that the last bit was flipped. Uh, that's the most likely one because the most likely is only one bit flip maybe. And if a bit flip has to happen somewhere, it's more likely to happen at the end as I mentioned before than at the beginning. Okay, is that a code word? Yes, actually that, if you recall, that was what I had transmitted in the first place, right? That was what I had said in the first place and you had received um, a distorted version of it. So then I say, yes, that's my maximum likelihood decoding. Now, why is this interesting? So of course, if I only had one code word and I just kept guessing the noise, eventually I would identify the true noise. But remember that even though I'm working from the noise, I don't actually want to recover the noise, okay? I want to recover the code word. So what I want to, uh, what's gonna happen is that sometimes if I guess a noise where the difference between the received signal Y and the noise that I guessed happens to be a code word, even though it's not the correct code word, I will make a mistake, okay? It's inevitable that there's a problem of making a mistake. The only way to make absolutely no mistakes is not to have any rate, okay? In the models that I'm using. So we're gonna call the difference between the transmitted code word and the other possible code words. Remember, I chose those two, the NR code words. So the difference between those, I'm gonna call a code word difference noise, okay? It's a noise that would take me from one to the other. And if I query a code word difference noise before the true noise, I'm going to get an error, OK? Um, and this is basically what we've done in our work, which was uh, recently, um, uh, recently published in IT Transactions. And the way that I want you to think of this is that I have a race. I have a race between guessing the true noise. If I guess the true noise, I remove it from Y, and that means I recover X. And the code word difference noise. The code word difference noise is an incorrect output. If I guess any of the code word difference noises, I'm out of luck. I'm gonna get a mistake. I'm gonna get an error in decoding. So I'm trying to guess the code word, the real noise, rather than code word difference noise. Now, the problem is there's only one true noise, okay? The one that actually happened, and I don't know what it is. And there's a lot of, code word difference noises. Actually, there's two to the NR minus one, forget the minus one, there's like two to the NR of them for all the other code words that exist, okay? Now, how long before I guess one of these uh, code word difference noises? Well, remember, if I do this random uh, code book construction, like Shannon said, again, remember, I could do it linear. I'm not going into that. It's exactly the same set of arguments. The location of these code word difference noises in the guessing order is uniform. Why? Because I basically look at two randomly chosen binary sequences chosen uniformly at random, you know, one half zero, one half um, one probability. The differences, I'm going to get differences roughly again with probability one half, which is like choosing another probable uniformly distributed one half one, one half zero probability sequence, right? The difference is itself a uniform. Uh, uh, random sequence. And therefore, how long before I guess such a uniform random sequence? Well, it's going to be basically, you know, 
each time that I make a guess, I have a probably one over two to the n of guessing one of those sequences. Okay, so it's it's a uh, it's, two, it's one over two to the n probability at each guess of guessing one of these sequences. I have two to the n r minus one, I forget the minus one of it. So the expectation of the number of times, we're just doing a Bernoulli, okay? Just Bernoulli guys, just Bernoulli. Okay, the probability that the expectation until I guessed one of these, you know, code word difference noises is two to the n one minus r. Why? Because it's two to the n r over two to the n. That's the probability per time just by doing a simple union bound. The expectation is just the inverse of that, just Bernoulli, take the probability of something happening one time, take the inverse to get the expectation until it does happen in a Bernoulli process. That's all we've done, that's all we've done. So I have two to the n, one minus our guesses to the error. Okay, back to this picture. When am I gonna guess the noise? Well, with high probability, my noise is in a set which is of size no more than 2 to the NHN. So that's it. We guess with high probability the noise after the typical set of 2 to the NHS noises. That's it. There's only so much noise. Even though there's a lot of different noises, high probability they're within the set of 2 to the NH noises. As a matter of fact, it's a set that has slightly higher probability a typical set because the most likely noise is not in the typical set, believe it or not. Again, we haven't exactly told you what it is. So it's a, it's a set of two NH noises, which is slightly higher than the typical set. And the typical set's already basically at probability one, okay? So I just want the true code word, the true noise guessing to win the race, even though there's only one noise, it's only one little noise, but it's its entropy is so much lower than all these code word difference noises that even though there's a whole lot of code word difference noises to the NR of them and only one little true noise, it still is going to win the race as long as, as long as its entropy is low enough compared to the rate, compared to that host of other code word difference noises. Okay. Note that if I wanted to guess the actual noise, it would take me more guesses, okay? And it actually would take me to do the NH one half, where H one half is the Renyi entropy of order one half for those, uh, for you Renyi entropy jocks in there, okay? Uh, and in that case, the rate, if I really wanted to ensure that I guess the true noise would be one minus H one half. Let me see in the chat if we have any, um, uh, if we have any, uh, uh, any, um, uh, coding jocks, does anybody remember what uh, what uh, one minus H one half is? You can throw it to me in the chat. Any any guesses? No pun intended. What is one minus H one half? Particularly for those of you in the in the audience that are not spring chickens like me. Does anybody remember the cutoff rate? Yeah, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Remember the cutoff rate? This is actually the cutoff rate, okay, which is lower. Okay, so basically now our, um, our, um, our, the, the rationale for algorithm is pretty clear. I have X, so I have two of the NR of these. I have N, the noise, I have roughly to the NH of these, at least that are of high probability. This plus is again, the sort of any invertible thing, okay? And instead of doing what the standard decoders do and the reason why they have to have all these structured codes because they follow what's almost an accident of presentation by, um, by Shannon and then Gallagher, which is, well, let me try to, you know, dig into this to the NR, we're gonna say, this is hard. Now remember, why did we become engineers? Because we want to do things that are easy. I'm going to go to the easy thing, which is this is easy because there's not a whole lot of them. So this is what everybody's doing. This is what I'm going to do. This is what we're going to do today. Identify n to the n using whatever structure of the noise, which is whatever sparsity is. So what do we do? I'm basically only using the code book as a code book membership device. It's think of it as a hash, I'm just hashing see if it belongs. If it belongs, great, I'm stopping. Otherwise, I'm going to guess next most likely noise effects. Remember how I started by guessing the all zeros, that was the most likely noise, and I guessed the all zeros and a one, that was the second most likely. I'm going to keep doing that 
until I get to a code word, okay? I may get to a wrong code word, but it would still be that I've done a maximum likelihood decoding, okay? So now the complexity is a function of the noise, not of the code, not of the code rate. This is also universal. Okay, and I'll show you later what I mean by short. I don't really mean short, I just mean uh, low, um, you know, moderate um, redundancy. Okay, uh, and you know, all I need, the only way I'm using the code book here is just- uh, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sure, go for it. Sorry to interrupt you. I think it's very interesting. So um, when you say that uh, universal uh, decoders are suitable for short codes, what kind of uh, length are you talking about? Hold, hold to that thought because I'll show you a picture of that. Okay. So it's a very personal question, okay? Um, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, so the complexity is a function of the noise. And again, when I'm, I'll get into what, what I mean, I'll, I'll show you numbers, I'll show you a, a graph of that. Um, and now let's think also of what we did here. Basically, the noise, remember, that was why I put in the redundancy. Remember in my, in my cycle, I was putting in the redundancy because of the noise, right? So really what I mean is that I'm going to do, I'm going to look at code words such as that this redundancy is not high. And this gets exactly to your question. Okay. This gets exactly to your question. So here are block lengths, here are rates. Typically what happens when people look at code centric approaches, they're limited in rate. The rate cannot be too high. What happens as far as the rate cannot be too low vis-a-vis -vis the length. So I can have long codes as long as they're high rate. I can have low rate as long as they're short, okay? Typically, anyway, the reason to go to long codes is to get high rate. So, you know, it, it's, it makes sense anyway, but, you know, people are used to thinking that high rate is more difficult. For us, the higher the rate, the lower the, the higher the rate, the lower the redundancy. The lower the redundancy, the less work I have to do. So does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's good. And there's a, a follow-up question I have, if I can ask you that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there is an interesting point. Uh, you said uh, decoding always results in error. Uh, now- No, it doesn't. No, 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 no. It doesn't always result in error. Good, good grief. Then you don't be out of business. Yeah, so what I was trying to say is, you know, when once we compress a source code, so while decoding, um, it is, I mean, there is bound to be some error, right? I mean, there, there will yeah, be some so, error. Um, by the way, just to be clear, we're not doing compression here. Yeah. Okay, we're not doing compression. All I said is compression uses the fact okay. that there is only two to the NH high likelihood strings. I'm not compressing. Nice. I'm not compressing, okay? I'm just illustrating something we know which okay. is a classical thing. So we know this and, you know, we knew, we learned that when we're doing compression, I'm used, I'm not compressing, I'm using that, uh, that knowledge that we have from whatever, you know, first year graduate course uh, to illustrate what we can get away with this. Okay? okay, but we're not compressing. Thank you. Of course, no problem. Okay, so why is the guessing the noise so much better than the brute force approach that Shannon had suggested, and which in effect generated all this other work that was done afterwards? Um, basically, if I did brute force guessing on the code words themselves, you remember that complexity? Remember there were two different difficulties, storage and complexity. Storage was resolved in the 60s. We were left with just complexity. This is what happens if you do brute force uh, guessing of the code words. It's going up uh, you know, this is in um, a blog scale. It's a code book rate. So this is going up. Uh, this is where I have 10 to the minus three bit error rate probably is by BSC stands for binary symmetric channels. So independent and include distributed bit flips. Um, this is if I wanted to say 10 to the minus three block error rate. This is when I, the, I go, you know, if I go above that rate, my block error rate goes beyond that amount. And what I'm pointing out is here, actually, you're going below, you know, you actually, your complexity in guessing the noise doesn't depend on the code word at all, until you actually hit a point where you kink down because your complexity in guessing goes down, because you're starting to have some non trivial probability of actually hitting uh, uh, the uh, a code word difference noise. So you're starting to have some probability of hitting the wrong code word, okay? 
So higher code words require either no more guesses or if anything, fewer guesses, okay? I told you, and we're gonna examine that a little bit more later in the, the talk. I told you that if I have any sort of memory in the channel, I don't wanna break it up. I wanna use it, okay? So here it's, you can see what happens. Here I'm having the same bit flip probability, but there's some structure here as opposed to being ID, there's a bursty Markov model. Now what happens is actually I can go to even higher rates, oh. even higher rates um, with, um, uh, with the block error probability of 10 to the minus three. Okay, so I can do even better and actually my complexity is even lower than if I was at a, at a, at a lower rate, okay? And why? Because even though I have the same total bit flip probability, I have a little bit of structure, I can use that in my guessing to be even more efficient in my guessing. Okay, so I mentioned the random uh, that were really part of the, the in effect, the, the lore of coding. There's really just a proof technique that was initiated by Shannon. The random linear, I'm putting 1970s. It was really 1968, but sort of more of the details were fleshed out in the 1970s. Um, let's go back to this, this, uh, this, no, this uh, picture of what it is that you can do with current codes. Um, what can you do if you were actually to do random codes, random linear codes? You could do everything. You know, the world is your oyster. You can do whatever you want, right? There's no structure, okay? Um, so what happens when I actually now do decoding on these random linear codes? This is what you get. Remember, I promised you we would fill in these, these blocks. And actually, this is exactly what we can do. And, and we can do these lengths and a little bit longer. Actually, we just, uh, we just got back a chip. I mentioned our collaboration with Rabia. We have a chip that does this. So you can put any old code, okay, up to a certain length, and it decodes it. Done. Okay, so it's actually not just a theoretical result at this point. Uh, and, you know, with very good uh, delay measures, very good um, Pico duals per bit, all, all the stuff that, uh, uh, that hardware people like. Okay. I'm just going to go very quickly into soft decoding uh, and just say that, you know, many schemes I mean, uh, use soft decoding. And soft decoding, what it is, is basically having some information from the transceiver. You know, it could be the RSSI that receives a signal strength indicator. It could be just that, you know, a variety of things. RSSI is probably the most common one. Uh, at first, you would say, if you do something naive, just, just quantize the information from, and then just based, and based on that, just do grant, you would say, well, as the quantization increases, my guessing would seem like it's gonna increase exponentially with the number of bits of quantization. That's not a good scaling. It turns out you can do much, much better. Uh, you, we actually have shown for symmetric channels how to use the full soft information. Uh, it actually has a heap structure. It's very interesting from an algorithmic point of view, very much heap structure, same things we teach uh, our, our students, you know, second year um, algorithms. Um, uh, you can do, if you just have like a single bit flip reliability, some of you may associate that with chase decoders, depending on your background. So you just see if a bit is reliable or not, and you fix the reliable bits. Um, you can you can also do that. It actually re, you know decreases your uh, your complexity vis-a-vis -vis not having soft information. It decreases it quite a bit. Or you can use something that Ken has invented called OrbGrand, um, where you basically do um, an ordering of sequences uh, based on soft information. It's I'm not going to go into it. But what I want to do is I want to compare this with what I've mentioned at the beginning of the talk is the, the, the state of the art, the Tal Vardy list decoder. And what do they do? Why is it called a list decoder? You first demodulate, you then do um, successive cancellation uh, polar decoder. And then instead of decoding to a single code word, you just code to a possible list. And then you use uh, the CRC as a checker to see which element of that list is actually um, is actually valid code word, okay? Uh, and so when I pull the L in the next slides that you will see, that's the size of the list, okay. Uh, now, even if I have a list decoder, even if I have a, a CRC-aided polar code, it is actually just a linear code. The CRC is a linear 
uh, is, is a nearly operation on a, on a code, which is itself linear. So the whole, you know, I do linear on linear, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle is linear, okay? So never mind how you made it or why you made it, it's just a linear code, just like any other linear code. So we don't need to do these two steps and I'm gonna show you how well we do. So as I showed you here, you know, at the beginning, I told you I would explain to you what this is. Again, this is the energy per, per bit over the noise spectral density. EB over N0, a very standard measure of, uh, of quality. This is block error rate, again, per code word. This is with length 16 uh, for that uh, CRC-aided uh, list decoding that I mentioned before. This is grand, no soft information. So this uses full soft information, this uses no soft information. And this is that clever way of using soft information I haven't told you about. It's a huge gain, guys, for the same code. Okay, it's a huge gain. Um, this gets back to your, um, Professor Ayengar, to your, um, to your question, okay? Uh, you can go longer, okay? Uh, with the soft information. Uh, now having the soft information is more useful. We still do better than the state of the art, but having no soft information is not good enough um, and even longer. And you, you can keep going on that, on that range that I showed you before. And remember that range goes into the thousands, okay? What about the random codes? The random codes are a little better than the polar codes. Now, when I'm talking about a random code, this is not, we went and looked through the random codes and picked a good one. No, the first random code that popped out of the computer, that was better than the state-of-the-art encoder. Just think about that. The first code picked dumb as a doorknob, okay? Not even anything cute, not even cute, okay? I didn't even choose the best out of four, best out of 10. Uh-uh, first one, okay, does better. Um, I'm gonna go through this uh, basically just to show you, you know, the random code pretty much always does better or they about to say, you know. Uh, interleaving, I mentioned to you at the beginning why I don't really wanna do interleaving because it adds extra delay. What does interleaving do? It takes the structure and the noise and it breaks it up, okay? This is some recent uh, work that we've had with our student uh, Wei An. Uh, and basically what happens is the, uh, the, the turquoise line is showing uh, Berlin Camp Massey. I mentioned Berlin Camp Massey before. It's a decoder for uh, BCH codes, uh, uh, both um, Chaudhary Hawk and Hanbuck codes. Um, and in this case, if I use a Berlin Camp Massey without, you know, without interleaving, it becomes worse. If I use a grand using this Markov order, that's what MO stands for, it becomes better. So what do I get? I get about a power factor of two improvement. And remember how I told you about the fact that I wanted to latency? I get a delay factor of a hundred, okay? Two times better, <laughs> okay, so, all right, this sells itself, all right. Okay, so um, I hope I convinced you we should make the math look like the engineering, we shouldn't make the engineering look like the math, okay? Um, and with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Medard. It was a very interesting talk.